Maisie looked at the clock on the mantelpiece. We'd better be off. They donned coats and hats and wrapped up against the chill wind that whistled around corners and blew across Fitzroy Square as they made their way toward Charlotte Street. Dodging behind a horse and cart, they ran to the other side of the road as a motor car came along in the opposite direction. The street was busy, with people rushing this way and that, heads down against the wind, some with parcels under their arms, others simply hoping to get home early. In the distance, Maisie noticed a man. She could not tell whether he was young or old, sitting on the pavement, leaning up against the exterior wall of a shop. Even with some yards between them, she could see the greyness that enveloped him, the malaise, the drooping shoulders, one leg outstretched so passers-by had to skirt around him. His damp hair was slicked against his head and cheeks. His clothes were old, crumpled, and he watched people go by with a deep, red-rimmed sadness in his eyes. One of them stopped to speak to a policeman and turned back to point at the man. Though unsettled by his dark aura, Maisie reached into her bag for some change as they drew closer. Poor bloke, out in this, and at Christmas. Billy shook his head and delved down into his coat pocket for a few coins. He looks too drained to find his way to a soup kitchen, or a shelter. Perhaps this will help. Maisie held her offering ready to give to the man. They walked just a few steps and Maisie gasped, for it was as if she was at once moving in slow motion, as if she were in a dream where people spoke but she could not hear their words. She saw the man move, put his hand into the inside pocket of his threadbare greatcoat, and though she wanted to reach out to him, she was caught in a vacuum of muffled sound and constrained movement. She could see Billy frowning, his mouth moving, but could not make him understand what she had seen. Then the sensation, which had lasted but a second or two, lifted. Maisie looked at the man some twenty or so paces ahead of them, then at Billy again. Billy, go back, turn around and go back along the street, go back. Miss, what's wrong? You all right? What do you mean, miss? Pushing against his shoulder to move him away, Maisie felt as if she were negotiating her way through a mire, Go back, Billy, go back. And because she was his employer, and because he had learned never to doubt her, Billy turned to retrace his steps in the direction of Fitzroy Square. Frowning, he looked back in time to see Maisie holding out her hand as she walked toward the man, in the way that a gentle person might try to bring calm to an enraged dog. Barely four minutes had passed since they walked past the horse and cart, and now here she was. The explosion pushed up and outward into the Christmas Eve flurry, and in the seconds following there was silence, just a crack in the wall of normal, everyday sound, then nothing. Billy, a soldier in the Great War, knew that sound, that hiatus. It was as if the earth itself had had the stuffing knocked out of it, had been throttled into a different day, a day when a bit of rain, a gust of wind, and a few stray leaves had turned into a blood-soaked hell. Miss! Miss! Billy picked himself up from the hard flagstones and staggered back to where he had last seen Maisie. The silence became a screaming chasm where police whistles screeched, smoke and dust filled the air, and blood was sprayed up against the crumbling brick and shards of glass that were once the front of a shop where a man begged for a few coins outside. Maisie Dobbs, Maisie, Miss. Billy sobbed as he stumbled forward. Miss, he screamed again. Over here, mate, is this the one you're looking for? In the middle of the road, a costermonger was kneeling over Maisie, cradling her head in one hand and brushing blood away from her face with the kerchief he'd taken from his neck. Billy ran to her side. Miss, Miss, Miss.